Good evening, everyone. I'm Georgia Davis, coming to you from Studio B on this edition of AZ Illustrated Nature. We'll tell you about the amazing world of butterflies in Arizona and beyond. Hundreds of native species live in our state, and tropical regions also have their own colorful varieties, now seen by many in special collections. Also, the month of September in our great outdoors, what you can expect in our Sonoran Desert this time of year. But first, here's a look at today's top stories. A national organization is working on efforts to legalize recreational marijuana in Arizona, hoping it will be treated the same as alcohol in our state. The Marijuana Policy Project is focusing on legalizing recreational marijuana in Arizona, California, Nevada, and other states after a successful effort in Colorado. The Marijuana Policy Project says it has not written the initiative yet, but plans to make it similar to Colorado's measure. Voters in Arizona already approved the use of medical marijuana in 2010. The state of Arizona is writing the guidelines to deal with edible marijuana, resin, and other forms of this popular plant, which could open the door for criminal prosecution, even though some might consider it legal as part of medical marijuana use. Arizona's Department of Health Services director says allowing medical marijuana does not appear to address some extracts from this plant, such as resin, which are presently illegal. The guidelines are scheduled to be ready later this month. And the United Nations General Assembly is scheduled to hold discussions on international migration, a topic that is familiar to millions of Arizonans and other residents across the country. Right now, the United States is considering comprehensive immigration reform, which could eventually lead to citizenship for millions of unauthorized immigrants. In Arizona, both U.S. Senators say they support updating our present immigration system. The U.S. Senate has already passed the bill on immigration reform, but the House of Representatives has not presented its final plans. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Arizona is known for its variety of habitats, which include low Sonoran deserts and high mountainous regions, all of which contribute to a rich biodiversity in our state. Many people flock here to see a wide collection of birds or reptiles, but there is also a growing interest in our insects, and butterflies are a prime example. The state is home to hundreds of species, and tonight we'll tell you about two local destinations that are doing more to attract them. Reporter Heather Gray and photojournalist Steve Riggs have the story. Many people think of Southern Arizona as a diversity hotspot for hummingbirds because of vast ranges of desert and soaring sky islands. According to butterfly curator Elizabeth Willett, this region attracts another group of winged pollinators. It's also a butterfly hotspot, but it can only stay that hotspot if we keep providing what those organisms need. Both Tucson Botanical Gardens and Tohono Chul Park intentionally attract native species of butterflies and work to educate the public on how to provide for the butterfly's entire life cycle. There are literally hundreds of butterfly species in southern Arizona and we're very fortunate here at Tohono Chul to be attracting more than 30 distinct ones. The list is long and colorful. The queen and monarch butterflies, pipevine and giant swallowtails, the gulf fritillary, and many types of sulfur butterflies. They all find food and mating grounds among their favorite native plants. We try to provide both larval and nectar plants for our butterfly species. Our queen butterflies are quite fond of things like milkweed, and in particular, uh, this is a case where that plant serves both as the larval food plant as well as a nectar-providing plant for the adults. And then our male queen butterflies like our, our ageratum, which is um, a beautiful sort of light violet blue flower. Okay, so there's your queen. Nope, oh, there's a couple of them right now. Males and the females are coming for nectar, but the males get the added benefit of being able to process this compound. They've taken in, digested, it goes through their equivalent of our blood and lymph system and it presented in this cup full of cells on the wings, black spot that you can see on the males that you can't see on the females. 
And then the female senses that rather actually, a smell thing. And that's what makes him attractive. Because of the weather conditions here in southern Arizona, we pretty well have butterflies breeding most times of the year, um, except in the dead of winter. Um, most of those spring butterflies will have mated. Uh, the females will have laid eggs on the larval plants. Gulf fritillary larvae exclusively eat passion vine. The butterfly egg is tiny, and yet we know we ought to get a big caterpillar out at, by the end. So the first thing that comes out is going to be a tiny caterpillar with a tiny mouth, because we're talking exoskeleton, fixed size to the mouth. Then it reaches a certain size, it's stimulated to molt, it prepares a new head behind the old one that's a little bit bigger, the bigger mouth, so it can eat more. After emerging from the pupal stage as adults, butterflies seek sources of food and liquids, like water, nectar from flowers, and sometimes sugars from fallen fruit. Their proboscis acts like a wick, uh, and they also have powerful sucking action. So a combination of liquid being drawn up by capillary action, and also the suction from their strong muscles, allows them to suck up liquid from lots of different sources, like moist sand, or fruit, or the nectar from flowers. The length of butterflies' lives depends on how much energy they stored by munching leaves as caterpillars. Butterflies' energy reserves decline day by day. The sugar they get from nectar only supplements their energy needs. Their lives can also be shortened by predation. Butterflies are part of the natural food chain. Um, they provide food for a lot of birds, um, even lizards. Uh, will eat butterflies. The best times of the year for butterflies here in southern Arizona seems to be late summer and early fall. So you're looking at late August, September into October, and then again in the spring. To help visitors learn more about native butterflies, Tohono Chul Park created an identification guide based on a butterfly survey they conducted on their grounds with the Southeastern Arizona Butterfly Association, or SEBA. Willett, a member of SEBA, says the group is a place to connect with other people interested in butterfly conservation. As you just saw in the previous story, you can find out much more about our local butterflies from SEBA, Southeast Arizona Butterfly Association, which focuses on conservation education, and recreation. Joining us to tell us more about the organization and its mission are two of the group's board of directors. Fred Heath is the past education committee chair, and Karen Nicky is the former president. And thank you to both for joining us here today. Thanks. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about SEBA. So what is that organization? It's a chapter of the National Organization North American Butterfly Association, and we have meetings and uh, support programs once a month during the school year. Um, we encourage photography and help in education about butterflies. We have a website and uh, support other organizations uh, through training sessions. Um, for instance, we're doing one at Tohono Chul. Okay, and I assume this is an organization that anyone can join? Yes, it's open to the public, and in the meetings, uh, you could come without being a, um, a member, but, you know, we hope that you join and find it interesting, so who knows? And about how many Cebians? I guess that's what you all call yourselves? How it's, many Cebians are there? It's about 100 uh, people in the local chapter. The national organization has over 3,000 people all over the United States. Okay, wow, so pretty big. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and talk about some particular local butterflies. You guys have brought in some images of some of the butterflies people can see here around southern Arizona. Right. So let's bring up the first one, which is a two-tiered swallowtail. Tell me a little bit about this state butterfly of the state of Arizona, right? Well, it's a state butterfly of Arizona, and it's usually seen at higher elevation than here down in Tucson. It, uh, flies around deciduous trees, and uh, you usually see it if you're hiking in a canyon. It's got a very floating flight and very noticeable as it goes by. Yeah, one of our biggest, showiest butterflies, and people always see it and tell, ask us about it. 
Well, and of course, the next one we're going to show you, the southern dog face. This, face, this is an interesting butterfly, right? Because the name is pretty literal. Yes, if you have a good imagination, which the person who named it originally probably did, um, you can kind of see a dog's face there. Um, it's on the top surface, and what we're seeing is light coming through, so we kind of get an idea that it's an eyeball and a, and a nose. It kind of looks like a poodle, I suppose, if you would have get if you had a good imagination. Right, and if somebody wants to get a better view, they'll just have to go outside and take a look. So where can someone see the southern dog face? Um, they're found down in the open uh, areas. They use acacias uh, as, as a food plant and uh, use uh, uh, things like uh, false indigo, which is way up in the mountains. So you can see them all over. Well, let's talk for a moment about uh, conservation. And I know butterfly gardens, they, they've been a popular thing probably, what, for a decade now. Um, so what are some of the conservation efforts that, that SEBA is involved in? And I assume that you know, people seem to love butterflies. So I'm assuming people already know quite a bit. Is that what you're, you're experiencing? Well, uh, the main way that SEBA is involved in conservation is through education. A lot of people, for instance, will go out and remove all the caterpillars from their citrus trees because they think they're going to kill the trees or because it's un unsightly. And those caterpillars lead to one of our most beautiful butterflies that we have around called the giant swallowtail, similar to the two-tailed swallowtail. So through our various outreach uh, venues, such as the insect fair that's coming up, or uh, at Tonachuo, we tell people that they don't really need to kill all those caterpillars or remove them. So it's our conservation efforts are mainly through education, uh, to cut down on pesticides, to plant native plants, um, to support efforts to preserve habitat. Right. Yeah, making them kind of uh, people understand that butterflies have an adult butterfly, which is a beautiful flying around thing, uh, looks for nectar usually. So that's sugar water that they get from flowers. Um, on the other hand, what the, what the, the, the growing and, and eating stage is the caterpillar, and that needs a particular host plant. And so maybe if you have a garden, you might want to have a few plants that they'll eat a little bit of. Um, like the giant swallowtail will eat a little bit of your citrus leaves. But, um, so you're actually suggesting bringing caterpillars into your yard, which I assume most people kind of go, Ooh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure I really want to go that yeah. far. Um, so but you said that they're not going to damage the plants? Well, they're going to eat some. Uh, uh, we have several citrus plants in our garden. My wife, uh, Mary, is a, uh, she likes to raise uh, butterflies uh, from the, and so she watches the female lay an egg on a, on a leaf in a particular case of a citrus plant, and then she'll collect the eggs and, and a few leaves, and then the caterpillars will eat those over uh, several stages, and then finally pupate, and then they'll come out as a, a butterfly, so she gets a charge out of that, so it's kind of fun. And so just to make sure, does every caterpillar turn into a butterfly? So, no. So, <laughs> okay. Some of them will turn out to be moths, which also have their fascinating aspects, and there are other insects that have things that look similar to caterpillars in their developmental stages, which they won't turn into either a butterfly or a moth. Um, and that's what we call caterpillars, those stages that turn into butterflies or moths. All right. So let's look at a couple more butterflies. Let's talk about the Colorado hair streak. That's an interesting name. <laughs> well, that's the state butterfly of Colorado. It's spectacularly beautiful with the blue coloring on the top of the wings. It's not really common in Arizona, but you can see it on Mount Lemon. Look for it around oak trees, and if you find one, you'll be very pleased. That's what the caterpillars eat, the, the oak leaves, so th that's where they're going to be. Oh, makes sense. And then how about the western pygmy blue? Well, that is kind of an interesting butterfly. It's the smallest butterfly, and it's about three quarters of an inch across. Um, and their food plant is very salt bushes, et cetera. Um, so they don't usually bother uh, garden plants. Um, and sometimes you don't even realize they're, they're butterflies. They're so small. So for someone who wants to bring butterflies into their garden, what kinds of things should they be planting? 
well, native plants more than anything else because the butterflies aren't attuned to eating non-native plants. The, the caterpillars aren't. They can get nectar from flowers that aren't native. But as Fred mentioned, they have to go through a whole life cycle. So if you want butterflies to stick around, the female butterflies are looking for plants that are suitable for laying their eggs on. And you have to provide that in order to get them to stay around. Are there any natives in particular that are, are more beneficial for butterflies than maybe some others? Well, if you have mesquite trees on your property, they attract a lot of butterflies. Um, Lagacia, which as far as I know doesn't have a common name, okay. uh, is a good native plant. All the milkweeds will attract queens and monarchs. Um, so those are a few. Can you think of any other spread? Um, yeah, uh, hackberry, desert hackberry has an empress lelia. It's kind of a kind of a nice looking butterfly. Again, they won't eat too much. There's lots of um, of them in Sabino Canyon, and there's lots of desert hackberry still. So. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about Seba and some of the things going on in town. So, uh, you know, where can people go? What can they do to learn more about butterflies, including some of the ones we're we're seeing today? Well, we have our meetings on the. Uh, third Tuesday of the month at Tucson Botanic Gardens at 7 o'clock. And as Fred mentioned, everyone is welcome to come. You don't need to feel intimidated that you don't know about butterflies uh, ahead of time. We're always welcome to beginners, and children can come too if it's not too late for them on a school night. Uh, we also have field trips that you can find out information about those on the website. And once again, everyone is welcome. You, you can always enjoy butterflies without knowing the names. And there'll always be people on the trips who will be happy to help you. Bring your camera, bring water to drink, and uh, prepare for a fun time. Yeah, I think the, the, the digital camera and, and the, the fact that people have them and stuff. I just use a point and shoot camera. All of uh, the pictures that we're showing here are done by my wife, Mary Klinkle, who has basically a point and shoot camera. And so they're great opportunities uh, um, to get pictures that you can look at later or send to your relatives or whatever. So it's kind of fun. Well, let's talk about the butterfly tours that are coming up at Tohono Chul. So this is something new? Yeah, um, we got involved and we were doing some surveys for them, SIBA uh, was, to just get a, a, an idea of their list. And then um, we've made, uh, I made a presentation there to some of their docents, uh, kind of teaching the butterfly biology and of the local butterflies. And then Karen led the first walk where we actually took the docents out as part of their training and the public to get them so that the docents can take over and uh, uh, show the butterflies that are uh, uh, abundant in Tohono Chul. All right, and then we've got just a little bit of time left, so let's take a look at one more picture. We've got a queen mated pear butterfly, and right. I guess people often mistake this for another very popular butterfly, yes? Yes, a lot of people look at any big orange butterfly and think they're seeing a monarch. Monarchs can be seen here, but they're much less numerous than the queens, so. Um, the queen, you'll notice, is about the color of a Mexican floor tile, sort of a burnt orange. The monarch is actually a little bit brighter, slightly larger. Um, if you see a big orange butterfly, that's what you're most likely Probably to be seeing. Probably a queen mated pair. All right, well, thank you to both of you for coming in. And just a note to our viewers, if you come back tomorrow night, we're going to have a, a feature on the insect festival where, of course, you can see butterflies, arachnids, and all kinds of insects. So I want to thank to both of our guests for coming in today and telling us about SEBA and the wonderful world of butterflies. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Yeah. On television and on Capitol Hill, President Obama launches a wide-ranging campaign to win public and congressional support for his plan to strike Syria. In an interview with Gwen at the White House just minutes ago, the president made his case. In Damascus, President Assad said the U.S. is lying when it claims he's gassed his own people. Assad's full conversation with Charlie Rose airs later tonight on PBS. We'll talk to Charlie about it in a few minutes. 
We'll have reaction to both interviews in tonight's program. Also opening the doors of the nation's most elite colleges to all. Jeffrey Brown looks at a program for students from low-income families. Those are just some of the stories we're covering on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Tonight on a special presentation of The Charlie Rose Show. Do you expect an airstrike? We have to expect uh, the worst. An exclusive full-length interview with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Will there be attacks against American bases in the Middle East if there is an airstrike? You should expect everything. You should expect everything. Don't miss Charlie Rose's interview with Bashar al-Assad tonight at 8 on this PBS station. And now we go from local to exotic in the world of butterflies, where an attraction in the Phoenix metropolitan area is drawing large crowds from all over the state and beyond to see these flying insects from tropical regions of the world. Tony Paniagua and photojournalist Bob Lindbergh take you on a tour. Butterflies and moths are some of the most colorful and intriguing members of the animal world, almost mystical in some ways with their silent flying maneuvers, their close relationship to flowers, and their brilliant hues. That is Papilio palinurus, or the green-banded peacock. It's also known as the emerald butterfly. And that one is from Asia, tropical Asia. The insects are even iridescent in some cases, like little jewels with radiant wings. The blue morpho is one example. Mm, that's everybody's favorite. And it was actually the first butterfly that we had here at Butterfly Wonderland. And it comes from a butterfly farm in Costa Rica, but they are native to South America in general. They like that color orange. Dana Cooper is an entomologist and horticulturist who works as the curator at Butterfly Wonderland next to Scottsdale, Arizona. At more than 10,000 square feet, Cooper says it's the largest butterfly atrium in the nation, and sparkling insects are the main attraction. This is one of the largest butterflies that we have at our conservatory, and it's called the New Guinea Birdwing. It's very, very colorful and very flashy. They come from distant or exotic lands, but they provide a very close encounter for the visitors, a place for lots of cameras and pictures accompanied by many smiles and memories. I think it's amazing. I've already had a couple of butterflies land on me, and it's a really cool experience. Katie Fritz and her family are here from Tucson as part of a trip to the greater Phoenix area and some of its attractions. Wherever they have been on previous vacations, these types of conservatories are some of the family's favorite places to visit. I think that the blue ones are really cool. There's a lot of them in here and they're flying all around you. It's really cool to see them. We've been taking a lot of pictures and just looking at them. There's a lot of them that land on the flowers and it's just cool to look around and see them all flying. It's just wonderful. You know, there's so many different colors, so many different sizes and types and it's great. We've actually been to two others. We went to one up in uh, Canada and one back in Ohio. And this is just as nice as either one of those. But the beauty is only part of the experience. There are also learning opportunities about science and nature. They are important pollinators. Um, they serve as a food source for lizards and snakes and other insects. At the Butterfly Emergence Gallery, for example, you can learn about the insect's famous metamorphosis. Butterflies and moths begin their lives as eggs that hatch into larvae. Then they transform into pupa, cocoons and moths, or chrysalis and butterflies, before emerging as winged adults. It's a very different creature from their larval state as caterpillars. The caterpillars are kind of fantastic. They do eat a lot of foliage, so they do need to be tended to during the farming process. But at the farms, they harvest the chrysalids and the cocoons, and that's what they send us directly. And that's how we are able to have all these tropical species here in the Sonoran Desert. And while ecology and entertainment go hand in hand at this exhibit, others are finding spirituality among these delicate creations. Patty Corbelli is visiting the conservatory on what would have been her mother's 69th birthday. Corbelli has her own special picture for this occasion, one of her mother, while she walks serenely on the paths and contemplates life. 
Uh, my mom was battling cancer for about a year and a half, and she's always been interested in butterflies. And if you ever came to my living room, it's full of little butterfly trinkets everywhere. And um, we would take walks out in the park and see little butterflies there. And then her cancer got worse, and so um, she passed away September 3rd of last year. And uh, we didn't get to come here. I was hoping, you know, she would last a little longer so we would be able to see the butterflies together. And her favorite color is blue, and she would have loved the blue butterflies. And Corbelli also feels that passion for these intricate insects, a shared sense of wonder and admiration that's been passed from mother to daughter. I see my mom. Every time I see a butterfly, it just reminds me of my mom because I know she's there. I know she's around me every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, yeah, every, just one just flew by me, so I know that was my mom. It may not be the experience you might expect if you visit one of these displays, but just like colorful paintings on a canvas, everyone has a slightly different interpretation of their observations. Inspirational impacts from the world of insects. And tomorrow night on AZ Illustrated Science, we'll take you back to Butterfly Wonderland where you can learn about two of nature's most industrious insects ants and bees. It's all part of a special show that is focusing on the captivating world of insects and arachnids in our region. Our recent rains and cooler temperatures are welcomed by many people who are hoping for a conclusion to our long and drawn out summer. September is a month of change in the Sonoran Desert. Fall begins in less than two weeks and the monsoon officially ends at the end of the month. Next, we'll learn about some of the developments you can expect to find this month in our great outdoors. Hello, I'm Jesus Garcia at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. People unfamiliar with the desert may think of it as a vast, barren stretch of sand. However, the Sonoran Desert is one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. Important ongoing studies are examining this biodiversity with its many landscapes, plants, and animals, and the complex interactions that take place between them. On a single acre of cactus forest in the Tucson Basin, as many as 100 species of native plants coexist. At least 96 species of reptiles that live in the Sonoran Desert can be found nowhere else in the world. The closer you look, the more you'll be surprised at the astonishing number and variety of plants and animals that thrive here. In September, when the summer heat is behind us and the moisture from our summer rains lingers a bit longer, it's a good time to go out and enjoy this biodiversity. The Sonoran Desert is anything but a barren stretch of sand. That's our show. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, you may visit our website at azpm.org. I'm Georgia Davis. Thanks for watching.